Talamoan Exiles! My name is Alexander Sennikov. I am a senior graphics programmer of Grinding Gear Games. Uh, some of you might remember me from the previous ExileCon when I did a presentation of the graphics techniques that we used in Path of Exile back then. Boy, do I have more for you. Um, and I also want to go, this time I want to go deeper in explaining how these techniques actually work. So it's probably going to get quite intense. Uh, I guess brace yourselves. There's a lot of stuff. Um, the first technique, let's just get right onto, it, right onto it. The first technique I want to talk to you about is uh, flowing materials. It's a very basic technique that is used everywhere in our game. Um, it's a pretty typical effect. So how do we do this? Well, let's break it down. Um, this is an effect that is driven by a velocity map. So the goal is to have a texture that flows according to some flow that we calculate from somewhere, provided as a texture or we calculate it. Um, the way you'd naively try to do this is what if you try to apply a displacement to a texture and then just keep increasing that displacement over time? Well, this is what it creates. It creates this nasty warped texture. You just cannot keep distorting the texture indefinitely. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the way this problem is solved is usually you have layers. So you see this layer appears, shifts a little bit, and then disappears. It fades in, shifts a little bit, fades out. And then if we apply two of these layers that shift out of sync with each other, you get a perfectly smooth transition from one uh, to another. So it, you don't see how they actually fade. But we went further. This technique has a downside that you, if you stare carefully enough, you can see the, sh the fading between these two layers because one, when the entire layer fades out and then the other layer fades in, you can see some sort of a transition. The way you can solve this is you can also apply some sort of a noise to each of these layers to create this more random looking, more organic looking transition so that each layer flows, but instead of fading in and out entirely, uh, it has some sort of noise applied to it. And if we apply two of these layers together, then it looks much smoother. It looks like a much smoother transition. So we use this for lava, for water, for any sort of liquid, basically. Uh, by the way, for this te specific technique, uh, I prepared a shader toy demonstration because I very frequently uh, I'm asked this question, how do I start programming mm, graphics? Like, what do I do if I want to start graphics programming? Well, I always answer that, in my opinion, the best thing to learn graphics is just do graphics. Uh, try programming shaders. And a great way to start programming shaders is get a shader that works. For example, this shader that I provide here that implements this effect, and just start hacking it. You can modify, you can see its effects on shader toy. Here is a link. And uh, just experiment with it and learn this way. Uh, next technique that I call subsurface ray marshing. Um, Here's an example of what it allows us to do. Uh, you're going to see a lot of Ranger because we typically use uh, the model for all our tests. So what is ray marching? Ray marching is a process in computer graphics of rendering any sort of volumetric material. So when you have fog, when you have water, when you have some sort of material that transmits light and doesn't block it entirely. Um, Challenges of ray marching is that it usually involves a sort of a loop. When you ray march through a volume, you need to apply light. You need to calculate lighting for every step of your of your ray, and that's typically very expensive. But you can see that a lot of games still do this because if you have to render a volume, there is nothing else you can do, so you do this anyway. But there is a better way. What if we ray march in a texture space instead? Then we don't need to store actually a 3D volume data. We can just use a single 2D texture and derive multiple layers from it. So here's an illustration of how this can work. Blue is a view ray. Um, orange is a surface that we are rendering. And there is a bunch of parallel planes that are subsurface planes. So we can calculate uh, texture coordinates for these subsurface planes. And if we align them together, they look like a volume. So here is an example of what it looks like. For example, you see multiple volumes of water, um, sort of debris floating. Uh, and you see the nice parallax between them. Another example. You can also do a bunch of effects that look, they, they all look like there is multiple surfaces, but they are all actually one surface. And the look of multiple surfaces created in the shader by uh, introducing multiple la layers that are blended in the shader. Some more examples. This is a life orb that we planned to use for the UI, but unfortunately, it's making an Excel con. Um, but you can go further. 
The thing that uh, you can also do is you can use data that is already present on your screen to calculate color of each volume. And what it allows is it allows you to calculate lighting of a surface only once and then reuse that information multiple times to render multiple layers. This is how we can render stuff like fur. And actually, this technique I noticed is used in quite a lot of games recently. But I don't think it has like enough academic weight so that people publish papers about it. Different companies keep using similar techniques. They keep inventing similar clever uh, techniques. But nobody really talks about them because, well, I don't know why. I, I just think these ideas are worth sharing, and they're worth knowing about. Uh, another example is uh, some, some bear with an isotropic um, lighting model. Uh, some more experiments with a ranger. Um, the way these techniques function is they rely heavily on this transformation called TBN. TBN is a basis that allows us to translate small steps in world space into small steps in UV space. So this way, when we are ray marching a world ray, we can also calculate small offset, offsets in a, in a texture. Uh, it's used in lots of other techniques, such as parallax mapping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not like a new invention. But if you are interested in computer graphics, I really um, advise you to familiarize yourself with this technique just because of the huge range of effects you can implement with it. Um, to, 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 uh, next technique I want to discuss, by the way, uses TBN base as well, is called subsurface shadows. This is an example of a technique that allows to render uh, translucent sort of shadows. So, like, imagine, um, for example, if there is a shadow in, a, in smoke, you don't see a hard shadow. It gets blurred along the light direction. And typically, in order to simulate these shadows, you again need to employ volume rendering, which, is, which can be quite expensive. But there is a much cheaper way. And the way this can be done, uh, the, the reason why it can be implemented this way is because typical shadow map implementation involves an operation called percentage closed filtering, which is a, a loop that samples texture in a small radius to create this blurry, blurry look. But if there is already a loop, the cost, the, the expensive part of a shadow mapping operation is already paid. So uh, we, had come up, we have come up with this idea of what if we use the same loop to also ray march along the ray and also blur the shadow not only in a radius but in depth as well. And this is basically how it works. You can create for free because the cost is already paid for, of PCF. The, the cost is already paid. We can just spread our samples instead of spreading them in radius, just spread them along a ray. You get this translucent effect for free. Uh, next technique that we have employed, we call contact parallax. Uh, this is an example of what it looks like. A very typical problem that comes with artists <laughs> excessively overusing parallax, because artists love parallax, obviously, uh, is that uh, in order for parallax surfaces to intersect with each other, you need to either write fragment depth for each fragment of a parallax surface or, or do something similar. But it's very expensive, because if a fragment writes depth, the shader becomes very expensive. However, there is a much better way to, that avoids writing depth. Oh, by the way, another significant drawback of writing depth, it also creates nasty aliasing, because when a parallax map surface intercept, intersects with another surface, it creates nasty aliasing that is very hard to get rid of. But there is a much better way. What if you just get rid of the depth test? And what if you just fade surfaces? So here's an example of a surface. You, uh, oops. Here's an example of a surface. Uh, yellow is a surface, and uh, it intersects with this ground, black ground here. But instead of applying depth tests that, that creates this harsh intersection line between parallax surface and the ground, what if you just apply a smooth transition from one to the other and create this much nicer effect, basically, again, for free? So you see, uh, this allows us to blend a parallax surface into ground that creates a much nicer transition. Again, this is a technique that is kind of um, at some point, ob well, in some sense, it's obvious, but nobody really talks about it because I guess people consider it too obvious. I'm not sure. I know that a lot of other games do do this same thing. Like I noticed Diablo 4 does this. A bunch of other games do the same thing, but I've never seen a publication on it. So I think it's just worth discussing so that people uh, get inspired by these ideas. Uh, next, 
uh, technique was developed to solve a very prolific problem uh, in PoE specifically and honestly in many other games. This is rendering decals. What is a decal? Decal is basically a flat surface that you want to make it look like it's, like it's sitting on the ground. But very typical problem that happens when, when you try to do this is your surface intersects the ground ever so slightly. And you get these nasty intersection lines uh, when your surface, your decal, intersects the ground. And um, there is sort of workarounds that people employ to mitigate this problem, for example, lifting decals slightly above ground. There is another technique called projective decals that has a lot of drawbacks. It, it's, it's also very expensive. So while thinking about, like, what do we do about this problem? You see, like, this nasty line. The reason why this line appears is because of depth test. Again, because uh, when two surfaces intersect, only one of them wins, the one that is closer to you. So uh, either one surface wins the depth test, either the ground or the decal, and you always can see only one of them. So we asked ourselves, what if we just get rid of the depth test? Uh, and the better way to do this is if you just disable depth test completely and replace it again with smooth fade. This allows us uh, to create a much nicer transition. But, however, in order to mitigate the problem of surface look, uh, uh, surfaces having wrong parallax uh, when they appear under the surface, we can also correct their UVs to a UV that they would have had if they were sitting perfectly on the ground. This is relatively easy to do. It's, 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 it's techniques, again, similar to parallax occlusion mapping. But this combination of correcting UVs to a UVs of a surface sitting, perf to a surface sitting perfectly on the ground, as well as disabling depth test, allows us to create basically perfect decals that have none, no, none of the drawbacks of the typical decals, and they're very easy for artists to set up. So here is how this uh, decal intersects with the ground. You see it never sharply appears, it never sharply disappears, it never creates uh, harsh transitions. It's uh, very smooth, uh, very easy to use for artists. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison, what it looks like uh, on a player's skill uh, with and without this technique. And next technique that I think is worth discussing, again, it's not exactly a novel technique. Uh, it's used actually pretty widely in compressing videos. Uh, very typical thing that artists like to do is they build flip box of, eff of effects. So basically a flip box is a bunch of frames, usually 16 or 9 frames of a certain animation that they flick through. And if you just flick through frames of an animation, you see the transition from one to another? It looks like shifting, like interpolating sharply between frames. But the way to mitigate this is called motion vectors. You can distort source frame towards the destination frame, and you can distort the destination frame towards the source frame as they blend from one to another. And this way, you can create a much smoother transition with very low frame rates. So the, this flipbook, for example, has, some, has just 16 frames during the entire animation. But if you apply motion vectors to this, it can look much smoother. Like, it's the same amount of memory used, but it looks like a much smoother transition. The big question is always, how do you calculate motion vectors? And this question has no simple answer. There is no algorithm that gives you perfect motion vectors. They are even defined in a kind of sort of ambiguous way. So every uh, game company that uses this technique has to basically reinvent their motion vectors in some sense. Uh, and I want to tell you how we do this. Um, another example of just two frames blending so this is source frame, destination frame. You see how they smoothly blend into each other because of motion vectors. The way we do this is we build this hierarchical representation of motion vectors. First, we find motion vectors in a very low resolution way. So just a very coarse picture of what our motion vectors would look like on the, on the left. Then on the right, you see more, we refine that representation of motion vectors. And we can adaptively find perfect motion vectors by stacking these levels of details of motion vectors. Here's an example. Um, this is a source frame of some flipbook. This is the destination frame of a flipbook. We need to find motion vectors that translate this image into this image. Basically, we need to distort one, one image towards the other. The way we are going to do this is first we are going to overlay them. I, I'm showing uh, the first frame in red here and the second frame in green here. And when you combine red and green, you, you get yellow. So if we apply perfect motion vectors to this image, it should get completely yellow. So let's try to yellow this image. 
First, we are going to apply a very rough, I think it's just four by four motion vectors displacement. And you see like these frame already kind of sort of match, but in a very crude way. Then I'm going to keep refining and adding higher and higher resolution motion vectors. And you see here the iterative process that converges these images together and finds finer and finer refinements. And this is what it looks like when we apply the motion vectors to these two frames. You see a nice smooth transition from one frame to another frame. So this is a technique that we use well, for all of skills, for, for flipbox, for flames, for all that sort of VFX. Um, another technique I want to discuss today is uh, bent normal shadows. Here's what it looks like. Bent normal shadows on, bent normal shadows off. Bent Here's a comparison side by side. On the left, bent normal shadows off, bent normal shadows on. The problem they are solving is that when we have a texture of a material that contains in it some big geometry, for example, a normal map, this texture never encodes information about shadowing. So normal maps don't shadow themselves, uh, if I put it this way. So how do we overcome this problem? How do we make it so that the micro details in a normal map also cast shadows onto each other? Well, actually, the answer is that there is a, the information needed for this is already encoded into the normal map. Uh, it's encoded in AO. Ambient occlusion is a map that encodes uh, information about adjacent geometry to every point. And we can actually reuse that information to cast shadows. Um, yeah, what if we use baked occlusion for this? The way it works is um, for every point, we, have, we can define a cone that is guaranteed to not occlude any light that's coming from within this cone. The angle of this cone can be derived from AO, and the direction of this cone can be derived from a thing called bent normals. So bent normals basically, for each surface point, defines the direction that the light is most visible from. So this is the direction that you least expect to see a shadow from. So this, this is obviously an approximation, but it's a pretty neat approximation because we can use even normals or LOD of a normal, a mid map of a normal, uh, for the bent normal direction. We can use AO for the angle of the cone to create self-shadowing for, for very cheaply. It's almost free, applying this thing to a shadow, in a shadow shader. And this is actually the, the technique that we use for lighting um, on the PoE UI. Like, actually, the UI is completely 2D, but all the shadows that you see from in-game light sources are done with bent normals. Um, next subject, GPU particles. Um, GPU particles is, here's an example of what it looks like. This is one of the very early tests. Do you recognize the Ranger? <laughs> um, the point of GPU particles is if you have a finite amount of time, for example, one frame, where would you rather spend this one frame worth of calculus, for example, one millisecond, on the CPU or on the GPU? Well, the answer is it really depends on what exactly you're calculating. For example, calcul calculating gameplay is much more efficient on the CPU. You are much better off spending one millisecond calculating a gameplay code on the CPU rather than on GPU. But GPU is really good for calculating very simple, very repetitive tasks in huge amounts. And particles is exactly that. So that's why it's just very natural to calculate particle behavior on, on the GPU. And also, it comes with very nice benefits that particle systems have access to stuff that is only present on the GPU, such as depth buffer, so we can do a bunch of in interesting things with it. We actually developed a pretty intense, uh, pretty in-depth uh, GPU particle system that even allows some minor physics simulation. This is uh, simulating uh, some particles interacting with the ground. And we fully integrated with our graph editing system. So our materials are designed with these, with these graphs uh, that VFX artists can use, just visually connect things. And we just implemented our GPU particles into the same pipeline. Uh, here's another example of a GPU particle system. You see, now we can allow having many more particles, like two orders of magnitude more particles in the same calculation time as before, just because we have offloaded that calculation from the CPU onto the GPU. In the same amount of time, your GPU can calculate many more particles than your CPU. Uh, here's another example of GPU particles. And here's a bunch of, I really like these player skills. So you see when, when the meteor strikes or when the nova strikes, there is a whole bunch of particles advected by the shock wave. And another example, 
and uh, not sure if it was shown yet, but this is a player skill with, uh, with an ice shield. And these ice particles, they too reflect, uh, they react to players moving, they react to attacks uh, from monsters. Um, next technique, uh, rendering water. Last time we already discussed um, some things about rendering water related to flow maps. But in my opinion, the hardest part about rendering water is rendering specifically waves that wash up on the shore. That is just so hard. If you look up on the internet how to render water or whatever articles, you can find like a million articles of how to render water surface or how to render rivers, but you will find no articles whatsoever about how to render beach waves because it's so hard. Like, there is simply no accepted solutions like, look, here's how you do it, because it's good and it just works. Because all solutions to render that types of waves are either bad or really complicated. So, today I want to tell you the way we do this. Uh, just to, get, to give you the idea. Um, th this is the, the effect that I'm talking about. So basically when waves wash up on the shore, um, they dissipate, etc., etc. So, the unfortunate part about this task is that there is almost nothing we can pre-calculate. Like, even approaching this task, like, what do, what do I even do? <laughs> it's, it's a pretty complicated task. Um, and there is a lot of moving parts. So, one very important thing is, when you come up, when you need to solve such a complex task as rendering um, waves that wash up on the shore, it really helps to break it down into parts and try to make them as independent as possible. So for example, rendering water surface itself should be completely decoupled from constructing the geometry of water surface, because these, tasks, these two tasks can be solved completely independently, and they should be solved completely independently. It's just much easier to tackle them this way. Another thing that I sort of taken away uh, from, from doing this is that there is going to be a lot of parameters, like controlling behavior of water. There is literally hundreds and, uh, of numerical parameters. There is thousands of functional parameters. And the only way to deal with them is to limit the range of each parameter, basically to define the correct range that each parameter is allowed to have. So for example, um, distance can be only positive, right? Distance can, cannot be negative, etc. Basically just basic physical limitations, and you renormalize every parameter to have this correct range of 0 to 1, so that you can never have the temptation to have like, well, I would rather set this parameter to 1.3. No, just define a set range of parameters that are safe, that you guarantee your shader will always work correctly with, if your parameters are within this range. Um, well, let's break down how the shader works. So first, we break water into these zones. You see these parallel zones. Uh, and within each zone, there is a layer uh, that carries one wave. Um, I am here applying a noise to this wave that shapes it in the maximum possible amplitude. So this noise is just a sine wave that goes from minus one to one. So the wave cannot be deformed any more than this. And this is very important. Let me show you why. Because if we apply two of these layers, you need these layers to never intersect with each other because the shader only calculates two layers for any given point. And if we allowed the waves to deform any more than this, then they would start overlapping and the shader would stop working. That's why I brought up the uh, allowed range. So again, what happened here is there is one layer, then I color in a different way, then I overlay multiple layers, and you see we are already creating sort of a seamless thing that uh, where one wave overlaps correctly with another wave. Next thing is we color it in a more natural way. Then we replace the sine wave dummy noise with just a texture noise that looks nicer. Next step is we apply some sort of um, screening on top of each one of these layers. Then we apply distortion to make these layers more organic. And that's how we get the final effect, basically. So just to get through this again, this is layers, then we overlap these layers, then we color them, then we apply more organic noise, more noise, and this is the final effect that you get. Um, next technique, and actually the, a lot of previous techniques, they, they all often intertwine, like you see most of these techniques use, for example, TBN bases in some sense. Most of these techniques use fields. So what is fields? 
fields allow creating any sort of liquid looking surfaces. Basically, when opacity of a surface is in some way connected to its normal map, which is almost the case for liquids. So whenever a liquid dissipates, it has like a vertical normal. When it doesn't dissipate, it has like a horizontal normal. So this basically allows creating sort of blobs. Uh, the way field is not an our invention thing. They are widely used in all sorts of shader demos and demo scene. It's a very popular technique. But for some reason, uh, well, it rarely gets into the hands of artists. <laughs> like, demo sceners look, uh, use this thing all the time, but for some reason, VFX artists don't use it that often. And I decided, like, how can we expose it to artists? How can we give them this tool that allows them to create liquid surfaces? Basically, a field is, uh, simply put, is just a value and the vector that says how much this value changes. So basically, it's a value plus its gradient. And then you can add this, uh, these fields just by adding a value and its gradient. You can multiply them the same way how you add a value and a gradient, et cetera, et cetera. You can do all sorts of operations that you usually do with just a uh, floating point value, but you can do them with a field. And this field carries information about a surface opacity and at the same time about the normal associated with the surface. So it basically allows conducting all sorts of surface operations with preserving correct, correct normals that react correctly to light, that react correctly to rotations. Uh, here is another example of fields, which is a druid skill uh, volcano that's done with fields. Again, fields are, are integrated into our um, graph editor so that artists can basically utilize them. Here's another example, uh, just some test effect with water. Um, and the last but not least, probably my proudest achievement that I want to discuss, global illumination. What is global illumination? Well, global illumination is the process of light bouncing between surfaces. Here is what it looks like if this scene has global illumination on. Here is the same scene without global illumination off. You can see that light gets propagated from really bright areas into darker areas. And the way that this process works is each point of the scene casts light onto every other point of the scene. And every point of the scene receives light from every other point of the scene. And also each point of the scene can block light between arbitrary other points. This many-to-many -many interaction is just notoriously hard to calculate. Calculating global illumination is an extremely hard problem. I dare to say it's the hardest problem in computer graphics. And, um, Actually, calculating global illumination is relatively easy. There is an algorithm called path tracing. It's just the only problem is that it takes like minutes to render every frame. It's extremely slow. The hard part is calculating in real time, like in a game scenario. And uh, there is a lot of typical ways that they solve this in the industry. And uh, unfortunately, none of them really fit us. And we had to do better than that. And our previous solution that we talked about on the previous ExileCon was dare I say, the first of its kind in the industry. We implemented in PoE, and PoE was the first game that shipped with a screen space global illumination based on variance. And uh, it, it was very novel at the time. But it had just a few drawbacks that, I, that really kept gnawing me <laughs> in my sleep. I really wanted to solve them. And these drawbacks come primarily from the fact that our screen space shadows had very important properties that our global illumination didn't. And these properties is that parts of, a, of our screen space shadow algorithm that don't require much detail are calculated in a much lower resolution. So our shadows are, in, are implemented via these cascades. So you see the first cascade here has only low resolution part of each shadow. Second part, second image has only higher resolution of the shadows. And the last part is a tiny bit that requires shadows to be calculated in the highest resolution. But it means that each of these can be calculated in vastly different resolutions, making it much cheaper to calculate this in a downscaled resolution, rather than if we were trying to calculate the entirety of the thing in the same highest resolution. So this is, this was very, this is a very important uh, property that our shadow mapping algorithm has that actually I still haven't seen any other game implement this in this way with uh, cascaded shadow maps. And I really wanted to adapt this property to our lighting. So I wanted to, our GI global illumination to have this property as well. So 
the typical way people il implement uh, global illumination is with radiance probes. Radiance probes are these, uh, you can think of them as tiny cameras that you put all around your, ge your level, your geometry, that take a cube map, basically a photo of what surrounds each point. And then you use that information and code it in these cube maps, in these light probes, to light any object, basically see if I'm standing here, I'm checking what's the nearest camera to me contain. It contains this cube map. I'm applying this lighting to myself. Here, um, this is an approximation of global illumination. But the big question to ask here is how many of these cameras do I need? What resolution do I need to use to each pro uh, for each of these probes? And uh, you, can, you can see that every game development studio comes up with their own answer. Some game development studios use lots of tiny probes. Other game development studios use a lot of, uh, use much fewer, much higher resolution probes. And it seems like there is no answer. But what if we use them all? What if we create a hierarchy when we have both high resolution probes, that, but very few of them, and we use another grid with much more probes, where each probe is much, uh, has much lower resolution? This is what I call radiance probe hierarchy. Um, I was struck with this idea and I just needed to implement this. Um, implementing this 3D was very hard, so I just decided to do a 2D test. By the way, 2D global illumination is almost as hard as 3D global illumination, so I just decided to test in, in 2D. Um, those of you who subscribe to my YouTube channel, you might have seen this experiment um, where uh, th this is 2D global illumination, basically works perfectly. Like this idea worked perfectly on the first implementation, which never happened. <laughs> um, and uh, here is a breakdown of how it works. You can see that there is these cascades, that each cascade contains a different number of rays, which corresponds to different resolution of the light probe. Um, and if I change the, the cascades, they converge to, to proper lighting. So this is a this is final image, and this is how it is constructed, constructed from these cascades. Well, let's see in closer detail how these cascades work. On the left, you see a grid of cascades, where, of grid of probes, where each probe casts just four rays. So you see, like, four, right, four, four rays from this probe, four rays from this probe, etc. just a grid of probes. The right cascade contains fewer probes, but each probe casts more rays. But the question is, how many rays do we get if we combine these, uh, these two cascades? It gets very messy. You cannot, you cannot really read easily what's happening on the left image, just when, what happens when I combine the probes. But if you look at every individual probe, we can see that we can actually construct eight rays per probe. These rays are not perfect. They are slightly bent. You see, well, rays are normally straight lines, right? But these rays are slightly bent. However, if we make these segments shorter, they will, they will start approximating lines more and more perfectly. So we can actually, th this thing converges to perfect rays. But there is eight rays per probe, and there are 16 probes. So the first image contains 30, uh, 64 segments. The second one contains 32 segments. But when we combine them, we can com create 128 rays total. Well, this is curious. This means that if we increase the number of these cascades, so I have just shown three, right? The number of rays that we cast by, with increasing number of cascades is 64, 128, 256, it's power of two. But the total cost for calculating these cascades approaches a constant. We can calculate 100 cascades at almost the same cost as we calculate one cascade, because, because each next cascade is cheaper than the previous one. When I first realized this fact, my mind was blown, because this is a property that you see in no other uh, rendering approach out there. At least I haven't seen anything like this. This means that the number of rays increases exponentially with the number of cascades that we use. And the total cost of infinite number of cascades is bound. It's less than a constant. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> but this is literally what it is. This is what I learned when I implemented the first 2D version of, of GI. Rays get exponentially cheaper with more cascades. So the more rays you have, the cheaper they get. But this is literally what it is. 
Well, I was quite excited when that 2D demo worked. Obviously, uh, the next question was, how do I adapt this to PoE? Because PoE is 3D, <laughs> and uh, implementation of it was to, my first implementation was 2D. Well, long story short, we did get there. We did implement this algorithm in 3D. Here is how it works. This is the first cascade. You see it captures information about on, in, only in tiny vicinity of each point. Basically, it looks like bad AO that you typically see in games. Next cascade captures lo longer field information, and, and it's lower frequency. Next contains even lower frequency, and so on. So we create this hierarchy of probes, where each when each level of hierarchy captures only a specific range of radiance, of light, basically. But then the magic happens when we combine them all. Because this way, we can get details of all scales, from fine details to very long distance details in, in the same image by combining information from all of, uh, of the hierarchy levels. Um, this is how we encode, for those you graphics program aficionados, this is how we encode uh, screen space probes, basically in these tiny grids. You can see that this level contains these tiny probes, there is a lot of them. And this level contains much larger probes, and there is much less of them. But the memory that each layer, uh, that, that each cascade level contains, actually decreases the more cascades you have. So the first cascade is the more expensive one. Weirdly enough, the cascade that contains the tiniest bit of occlusion is the most expensive one, and they get exponentially cheaper the more cascades you have. Uh, here is the implementation of the same technique in 2D. So the, the previous one, I always implement these like highly experimental, 90% gonna fail techniques in my like test bed uh, pet engine. But then I implemented in, in PoE. So this is again Glowing Ranger classic, uh, in lighting the scene with only indirect light. Uh, I should have probably mentioned this before, but calculating light from emissive surfaces is computationally equivalent to calculating light from directly lit surfaces. It's basically the same thing for a GI. That's why it's very typical to test global illumination algorithms by just having emissive objects. Um, this implementation that we have in game uses screen space information, it uses screen space probes, but actually, it can also be used in, uh, for other games. It might be more appropriate to use the same hierarchy of cascades in world space. And this demo that I also uh, posted on my channel actually does just that. It has no screen space information. It's fully uh, world space information, which means that it can calculate light sources behind the camera, which we don't have in PoE, which we don't need to worry about. Um, by the way, this technique, since it basically allows encoding light reaching every point from every direction. We can also use it to calculate specular, so basically reflections. So he, here you see one of the dungeons basically made of uh, mirror materials. We can calculate specular GI the same way. Uh, here is the same thing. You can see the highlights on the curtain from like a porcelain-like material that has a specular um, part in its lighting model. Here is another uh, example of specularly lit scene. And here's an example of a combined diffuse plus specular in-game. This implementation is even faster than on the previous one. So basically, the, all global elimination solutions converge to the same result. They, because the correct result is known, that's why I'm not even showing you side-by-side -side comparison, because if two global elimination algorithms are correct, they should produce the same image. The question is how quickly they produce this image. And this algorithm is just scales so much better than everything else I've ever seen. It scales even better than our previous one, even though the previous one was pretty good, honestly. Um, so yeah, this property of absolute double dipping and double exponentials when each cascade captures twice more rays for twice less speed is a totally OP exploit in reality. And you are the first audience to learn about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope. We have some time for Q&A from Octavian here. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, yes, there's a QR code up behind me right now, so if you've got any questions, be sure to scan that and send them in. I'll be vetting them as they come. But until then, I've got a couple questions as well. Um, so you mentioned during the talk a few times about like what other game companies might do or what other games are doing. In the course of your work, have you just like developed an eye for being able to see like, oh, they're using this technique or that technique, or uh, do you good. actually like, do you actually, you know, 
you know, have you asked people in the industry? Thanks, that's a good question. Uh, I like it. The way it works is when, when I just started working graphics programming, I was obviously curious. I always looked like at what other games do. But over time, you just you absolutely do develop an eye. You just see the same things over and over. Like I'm playing Monster Hunter, and I'm immediately seeing how they're doing their fur. Of course, they're doing it in screen space. I just naturally move it to the edge of my screen, and it produces the artifact that every screen space fur should produce. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> so can you play games normally anymore? Or I is cannot, it just... <laughs> cannot. <laughs> Play Elden Ring, and I try to get under every rat to see it from the nastiest angle possible. <laughs> All right, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, the first one here is something that you'll probably understand more than me. Uh, do you have to vary the number of cascades for different levels or geometries? Say it again, please. Do you have to vary for global illumination? Do you yes. have to vary the number of cascades based on the level or geometry present? So the thing about that algorithm is the cascades are always put in a fixed grid. The grid hierarchy is completely fixed. It's independent of the scene complexity. I should have mentioned that, but the cost of that algorithm is completely constant. Whatever happens on your screen, if you have one fireball on your screen or one million fireballs on your screen, it doesn't matter. The cost of that technique is absolutely constant. So it can never dip your FPS in a heat of battle. It has a constant technique, it has a constant cost of about like one millisecond or something like that. All right, next question. Do you feel you have an advantage by using our own bespoke engine versus ah. something off the shelf yes. that, you know, Th that's might another. have more documentation to it or something? Yes, I, probably worth mentioning that we have our fully custom engine that we have implemented for our own purposes, right? Because, because our game is not a general... We don't need to implement an engine that allows to to implement any other game. We are implementing a, an engine that specifically supports our game with our own limitations, with our own uh, things that we can exploit. For example, fixed camera, right? We never have to calculate lights that are behind us because there's no lights behind us. That's why our <laughs> global illumination solution can work perfectly fine in screen space because all the lights that you care about are on your screen. And yes, since we are developing our own engine, we have kind of personal attachment to it, and it's also why it's much easier for us to modify it, and it just feels natural for us to be working so closely with it. Uh, you mentioned towards the end of the talk having a video of one of your techniques on your YouTube channel. People want to know what the channel is in case they can go yeah. check it out and find some interesting stuff. I'm sure somebody will put that in, in, in the show captions. But yes, usually if you want to see like sneak peeks into stuff that has a non-zero chance to end up in Fury, you can follow my channel where I usually post all these experiments. Like all these 2 DJI experiments were posted like way before they actually ended up in game. I was just playing with it. I was just trying things. Like, they had a very high chance to not work out. But it's fine. Um, are there any remaining parts of Path of Exile's renderer that are expensive or annoy you? So sort of like the, the GI problem, you said it kept you up at night. Anything else uh, that's GI keeping you up at night? GI is absolutely the hardest, computationally hardest problem that I'm aware of in computer graphics, period. There is nothing harder than GI. OK. And we've, we've solved it better than anyone else, would you I, say? <laughs> that is my belief. It's I a big question. The, I do believe that our solution has properties that no other solution has, and I have never seen anything even similar to this. If you have, let me know. <laughs> uh, bes well, actually, this runs into the previous question. Besides the light occlusion, what's another technique you're proud of implementing in a Path of Exile? Well, honestly, just watching the trailer felt <laughs> unexpectedly emotional for me because, like, I put my finger onto literally any point on the screen and there is something I contributed here. Like whether it is, is a lighting model or there is like a fog here or I'm extremely a shade of specular aliasing that I see here or like there is some personal thing in every pixel of the game for me. So yes, I do feel proud that we got there, but I also feel <laughs> kind of sometimes ashamed like I hope they oh, don't come notice on. this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you've done excellent work. Uh, you showed examples of layering techniques on 2D planes and some 3D simple shapes, but what do you do if there's, say, a character model which is immersed in water or fire or something else like that? I, well, if a character model is immersed, well, we usually try to make it so that it doesn't explode in a really bad way. <laughs> like, the interaction between some of these techniques is um, sometimes questionable, which sometimes pops up in like nasty ways when, you, for example, somebody decides to make a, 
an MTX that turns the player into water. And of course, nobody expected this. <laughs> and now we oh, have to deal with it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, how do you slash grinding your games decide which technical innovations to treat as trade secrets versus share openly in a talk? I don't think there is anything that we keep secret, at least until like a big announcement like this. Like, because we want to make like a, a bigger announcement out of it on ExileCon rather than uh, if some of it like got leaked in mm -hmm. some sense. Mm -hmm. But honestly, we are perfectly fine with people uh, sharing their progress when it's, it's some, something to do with technical aspects of the game, when it doesn't have to do with like plot or like spoilers. But with technical aspects, we are actually free to share how we do things. Like I've been, it, it, people that have been following my channel, they knew what was happening with the GI from like half a year ago. I, w I just was progressively posting um, uh, the, the, yeah, how, how the algorithm developed. This niche little channel that yeah, it's a, it's a pretty niche channel, but I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. I use like oh, this is my right portfolio. <laughs> um, let's see, what's the next one? Do you have any renderer features you wish you got to build, but Path of Exile just doesn't need because of our very bespoke system? Um, if there was such feature, I wouldn't be talking right now. I would be programmed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is some feature that I could say like, well, I wish our game suited for these features better, right? Like, I wish we had TAA so that we would have nicer anti-aliasing, but we don't have a TAA, not because we are lazy or not because we don't know how to make it happen. It's just because our game is really dynamic and TAA really breaks down when you have a really dynamic game. So, so we're, we're just too good for that system. Well, you, <laughs> <laughs> sure. You gotta phrase it, or you gotta spin it. Yeah, um, like some people do come with like, well, you just should have implemented this thing, but <laughs> often the answer is like, we don't have this thing because of this and this reason, and this is just the way it is. Yes, he's a smart man, he did think of that. Uh, have you hit any interesting problems supporting both PoE 1 and 2 on the same engine? Uh, yeah. There, there is some like what? scaling. <laughs> I'm just thinking of what I should be talking about here uh, uh, okay, uh, because this can have some implications. But like, yes, because PoE one, well, for example, if if PoE two had textures that had resolution just twice higher, right? Like from 512 by 512 to 124 by 512. Uh, wh what's the difference? Well, the difference is actually four times more memory, right? So like the challenges with increasing just texture resolution are pretty obvious because you increase the resolution of texture twice and it uses four times more memory. So like supporting engines that need to deal with typical 512 textures versus one, uh, 1024 textures is just, yeah, that's quite different. But we do want to apply as much of the tech that we develop for PoE2 for PoE1 as well, whenever possible. And sort of leading off that, are we going to be using these methods in PoE1 now with the recent engine update patch? Uh, the GI is not going to be in this engine patch, but we are thinking about it. Just because it's such a huge change, uh, we were, I guess, decided to not ship it with a whole bunch of other changes that are also uh, very impactful. Like, they're, they're going to change the way engine behaves quite a bit. And I just f didn't feel confident enough of mm. shipping this GI solution right now. Do it in waves. You don't rock the boat quite too, too much. Uh, which is more common? Do artist creations drive the need for new rendering tech, or does rendering tech enable artists to have more freedom with what they make? Ah, that's another good question. Uh, it's both. They've got a lot of good questions. It's, it's both. So I should have mentioned that, well, a lot of these effects are not my doing. I just enable other people to create art using the techniques that I make. I don't actually create art myself. So. Everything that looks good on these images is like created by our effects artists. <laughs> I mean, you, it's still as much your, your However, doing as However, I, I should also, well, it's kind of an interesting point that, in my opinion, global illumination looks beautiful just on itself. You don't need any artistic talent to create a scene that looks beautiful because realistic lighting, in my opinion, just is beautiful. So if you manage to create lighting that behaves in a realistic way, it will look beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it looks great, and my job is staring at the game all day, so. Thank you. <laughs> um, aside from other games, where do you learn about these sorts of techniques? You mentioned there are some publications and such, articles. Well, I guess you live and learn. <laughs> learn something Fair every enough. day. Uh, there is actually 
well, my background is physics, right? I do, I, I studied physics. This is the primary uh, thing that drives my passion, right? But how is physics related to graphics? Well, the answer is programming graphics is programming physics because programming graphics is programming the behavior of light. Light be obeys physical laws. So just studying physics directly is directly translated into being able to program graphics. If you're really good at physics, you will be able to program graphics. Of course, like there is like tricks and stuff, but that's you just, that you just pick up all the, all the time. Also, like just playing other games is very useful to like, hey, how did they do this thing? And you just start learning, start digging until you understand how. You so know? if somebody wanted your job, they should get a physics degree and play a lot of video games. Absolutely, physics degree is the most important thing if you want <laughs> to get to graphics programming. Yes, that's, that's the most important thing. I'm halfway there. Um, what are some of the other techniques that you've developed uh, that are in the game that you wish artists would use more? <laughs> that's a little bit embarrassing. But oh, OK. Yeah, when artists saw these slides, like, Huh, we had this? Like, yeah, some of these <laughs> techniques are kind of hard to adopt uh, by artists. Like, um, it, it takes some dedication, like fields, right? Like, a, um, well, it's a lot of scroll, I'm not gonna show that again, but like fields is a very powerful technique, but it just requires like some doing to get used to, to using it. It's not like a very straightforward thing. It's like a different way of looking at, at your effects. It requires some level of attention. And some artists sometimes just don't have time. Like, one VFX artist had the time, learned fields, now they're good at this, but, art, but other VFX artists can just fall behind. And the, the technique can get kind of lost because of this, which is sad, but yeah, this happens all the time. Uh, so we are low on time here, so I'm just gonna go for one more question. Do any isometric optimizations need to be changed when capturing trailer footage specifically? Oh, that's a, that's a whole thing. We have, well, I'm glad we went with that yeah. as the last question. <laughs> yeah, you have a guy uh, who who does all the well, most of the filming, and I have a lot of issues coming specifically from him <laughs> when the game breaks down in terrible ways when you just put camera at an angle where it never was supposed to be. <laughs> Yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah, generally players are not zooming in quite yeah. that far or doing advanced camera work. Yeah, like when players say something like, why don't you just put the MRA horizontally? Or like, why don't we have more cinematics? Well, because a lot of assets are really not designed to be looked at different <laughs> angles from the angle you observe them in the game. All right, I think that is uh, just about our time, though. Thank and you, Octavian, for your questions. Yeah, and thank you all thank for, for sending for, them in for and being Thank you for listening. Here. I hope you found it interesting or at least entertaining. Thank you very much.